Thank you for joining us for this session of Family Council 101, Starting a Family Council. My name is Samantha Peck. I am the Director of Communications and Education for Family Council of Ontario, and I will be the presenter for this session. Family Council of Ontario works with family councils across Ontario as we lead and support families in improving quality of life in long-term care. To achieve this, we work collaboratively with our partners to cultivate effective family councils, advance public policy and system planning, and mobilize knowledge exchange. For more on our work and how we achieve our goals, you can visit our website at www.fco.ngo. In this session, we'll be discussing the overview of how to start a family council, or Family Council 101. Specifically, what is a council, who's involved, what are the benefits of a council, the why, and do an overview of how to actually start a family council. So if you do not currently have a family council and looking to start one, this is a session that we recommend to begin with for this overview. If you're part of an existing council, this session will also provide you with information on membership, high-level terms of reference, and more that may provide you with information that you're looking for. You can find other sessions that we've recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. Oh, what is a family council? So we're going to start with. The definition of a family council is that it's an organized, self-led, self-determining, democratic group composed of the family and friends of the residents of a long-term care home. Councils across the province are unique, but they share some common similarities. All councils work to improve the quality of life of residents in that long-term care home. And they give families and friends a forum for sharing their experiences, learning, and exchanging information. Each council will do this a little bit differently, but these are the core components or core goals of a family council. A family council isn't just like any other group. They have some specific characteristics. Family councils come together and interact with one another regularly. Most councils will meet monthly, most months of the year. Occasionally others will meet every other month but there is a regularity with which members interact. Members share a sense of belonging or purpose. They have a collective identity, and usually that's working together to improve the quality of life of the, their loved one and other residents in the home and supporting one another. Councils also have common goals and objectives. So the objective of improving the quality of life for everyone living in that home, There'll be also other goals that we're going to go into as well. Councils also, formal or more informal, will have some degree of structure, rules, and methods of operation. Usually this information will be contained in your council terms of reference, which we'll discuss as well. So while a council can be more informal or more formal, Regardless of the level of formality, you're going to have some degree of structure, rules, and methods of operation in order to carry out your work and achieve your goals. These are what we consider to be the four main family council goals. Now, each council will focus on these to a greater or lesser degree, but in all councils, they'll be present. So it's support, communication and teamwork, advocacy, and education. So let's dive a little bit deeper into what these goals are and what they mean for a family council. Support for members is an essential aspect of a family council. Many, many years ago when family councils were first developed, they were developed as peer support groups. That's affirmation, information, emotional, and sometimes practical support. No one knows what another family member is going through like a family member, and that helps people to feel less alone. It provides family members with a safe space to share their experiences, get support, and assistance in resolving issues. 
So you could say to a member that's going through a hard time that you understand and that you've been there and you can provide them with information on how you resolved this issue and what you found worked well. For family councils, we also need to consider the respect and confidentiality aspects. Some of what will be discussed in a family council meeting is very personal. It's things that members would not want repeated outside of the walls or outside of that meeting. So as you're developing your family council or perhaps redeveloping a confidentiality policy, you want to really consider how to respect the confidentiality of the discussions that occur within a family council meeting. And of course, you also need to balance this with how you minute the business aspects of your meeting. But it's important to achieve consensus as a group about your respective approaches to confidentiality and minute taking. Family councils can't really exist without communication and teamwork. So in order for a family council to be successful, you need to build positive mutual support. You need to be able to share council responsibility for roles and tasks to ensure that your work gets done. It's also about open communication and working with administration and staff. And that's not just for problem solving. It's also about sharing generally what you're hearing from families within your respective confidentiality and uh, minute taking policies, of course. And listening to the experiences of staff so that you can support the entire team as you move forward as a family council. And communication and teamwork really is the foundation for effective problem solving wherein you discuss both problems and solutions. One of the brilliant aspects of a family council is because you have so many people with diverse skills, perspectives, and knowledge and capacities around the table, when faced with a problem or an opportunity for improvement, you can draw on those folks as they contribute their perspectives to solutions. Two heads are better than one, and of course, when we're talking about family council, it's all of those heads around the table that can really contribute to creative and effective solutions. Family councils also have a really important role to play in connecting with the others in the home. So that's other families, residents, and staff to get their perspectives and opinions. Family councils are to support quality of life and care in a long-term care home. But how that is done relies on perspectives and opinions from everyone in that home. So listening to residents, connecting perhaps with the home's residence council to see what they're working on and get their feedback on ideas and initiatives. And having a positive and open relationship with staff that's everyone from administration to frontline care, support services, and so on, because they are valuable contributors to your work and valuable allies and partners. So communication and teamwork is really a foundation to an effective family council. Many family councils also focus on education for members. When you have a group of connected, engaged family members sitting around a table, you can figure out what it is that would be most relevant and useful for family caregivers to learn about. So perhaps that's programs and services from within the home. Maybe your families have an interest in learning more about how special diet menus are developed or the role of PSWs within the home. How does that differ from the nursing staff, so family members can get a deeper understanding of the way the home works. Could also be information affecting the loved ones, the residents in that home. So around health issues, maybe it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's that your members really wanna learn more about. Uh, maybe it's effective lift or two-person lift. How does that work? When is that needed? Perhaps it's falls prevention or another aspect of care and safety. Your council could invite a guest speaker from a community organization to come in to talk to you about these things. Could also be information about the long-term care sector, compliance, funding, et cetera. 
things that will help you better understand how the system works as a whole. And caring for yourselves, caring for the caregiver is a really important educational topic that you could pursue. So things around effective visits, making the most of a visit, or understanding caregiver grief and guilt and other emotional reactions. These are all things that a family council could focus on to better equip their members to be active participants in the long-term care home. Advocacy is also another really important role of a family council. Now, by advocacy, what we mean is shared issues and solutions for a collective voice. Family councils aren't designed or appropriate for resolving individual family issues. So let's say one of your members, Jane, is having an issue that is unique to her mother. The role of a family council would be to do that support piece that we discussed. It would be to provide her with emotional support, so saying that you understand how she feels and it seems like a really difficult situation, it's peer support. Perhaps informational support on how she can get this issue addressed but it wouldn't be the role of the council to take on Jane's issue as it's not a collective concern. Family councils, as per the Long-Term Care Homes Act, have the power to advise the licensee of any concerns or recommendations they have about the operation of the home. And those are collective issues. So shared issues, shared solutions for your collective voice. So if there is a shared issue that council chooses to pursue, you could bring that up through the concern process. And once have you have done so, the Long-Term Care Homes Act establishes that the home has a duty to respond in writing within 10 days of receiving a notice of concern or recommendation. So family councils are a really important problem solving, advocacy, and concern group within the home. It's something that is a power given to councils by legislation and is something that you can also act as a part of the long-term care home team in resolving these concerns. So that touched on one of the really important benefits of a family-led council, that families will have an opportunity to bring forward their concerns and their recommendations to others who understand their experiences. And there are also lots of other benefits of a family-led versus staff-led family council. What we have found is that when councils are family-led, when they take on all of the leadership roles, tasks required to achieve their goals, that members are more likely to feel responsible for the success or failure of their council. Because in this case, you not only have buy-in from members, but you have active join-in people are engaged in the processes and work required to achieve your goals. But if you do face an issue, an area of conflict or a problem, members are more likely to work together to address those problems and achieve solutions because they're strongly invested in the processes and goals and success of that council. And when family councils are family led, we also find that the members are more likely to, as a group, pursue the, pursue the issues and activities that interest them. Because you have that safe space, you have that time, that opportunity to share about the things that are most important to you as a caregiver and what you most want to know about. So then you can actually carry forward and pursue those issues and those activities because they're based on your unique interests. And in fact, when you do so, tasks are actually more likely to get done because they're spread among several members. And because families come from such diverse walks of life, those people can contribute their unique skills, interests, and knowledge to carry out those tasks and those duties. So when you have a family-led council, there are numerous benefits doesn't mean that you work in isolation. In fact, having strong, positive relationships with your long-term care home staff is really important in ensuring your success, but councils really should be led by and for families. 
So I can go a little bit deeper into the Long-Term Care Homes Act. It was mentioned in the previous section as per the advocacy and complaints process, but there's also a lot more in the Long-Term Care Homes Act that applies to family councils. So the act includes information on powers of a family council. So as I mentioned in relation to the advocacy and effective problem solving, councils have the power to advise the licensee of any concerns or recommendations the council has about the operation of the home. But councils also have the power to plan and sponsor activities for residents and collaborate with volunteers and community groups on those. So there are lots of ways that family councils can have a positive impact on the home and those are contained in part in the powers of a family council section. It's also membership, duty to respond, staff attendance at meetings, the duties of the home to cooperate, meet with and consult, to prevent interference, involve councils in mission statement development, uh, an opportunity for posting information, information for residents, the Act also contains information that councils need to be involved in developing, carrying out, and acting on results of the satisfaction survey. Uh, family council will get uh, involved in the annual inspections and quality improvement initiatives within the home. A few things that we wanted to pull out that are of particular note, and that's first around membership. So this is getting into the who for your council. As per the legislation, a family member of a resident or a person of importance to a resident is entitled to be a member of the family council. Now, family member seems to be pretty self-explanatory. What can be a little bit less so is the term person of importance. I know that this is not defined in legislation, but the understanding that has been arrived at in terms of what this means is family by choice, so people who are very important in the life of a resident but don't meet the strict definition of family member. But person of importance, this term, also allows for continued membership of a member, a family council member, who no longer has a loved one in that home. So if I were the member of ABC Family Council and my grandmother dies, if council has established in their terms of reference that they allow for continued membership, I can stay a member of that council. This is important because a lot of councils do have a large component or contingent of their membership that no longer have an active loved one in that home. So this is something you really wanna think about as a council. How do you approach the issue of continued membership? Most councils will allow for continued membership in their terms of reference. What's become increasingly common is for councils to consider a process around that. So for example, that, count, that members can, be, can continue to stay on the council for a period of six months, a year, indefinitely, or with review times which provide an opportunity for the council and that member to sit down and say, is this still working for us? Is there another opportunity you want to pursue within the council or in another involvement within the home or somewhere else? So something to think about is what does continued membership look like to your council? It's going to be unique to each group. The Act also gets into detail about who may not be a member of the Family Council. Now this includes the licensee and anyone involved in the management of the home, an officer or director of the licensee or corporation that manages the home, person with a controlling interest in the licensee, administrator, any other staff member, person who's employed by the ministry or who has a contractual relationship with the minister, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the two pieces here that tend to be most frequently asked questions are around the administrator and any other staff member. So, this list, section six, overrides, so to speak, the right to be a member. Meaning that if I were a staff member at XYZ Home, so I'm contained in this list here, this subsection six under 
any other staff member. But I also have a family member living in XYZ home, I still can't be a member of the family council because my right to be a member from section five here is subject to subsection six, meaning that I can't be a member because I'm one of those folks listed under subsection six. This tends to be more of a concern for smaller communities. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't provide information to and keep up to date persons who may not be members of your council, but it does mean things like they can only be in attendance at a meeting if invited, they don't vote, they can't make changes to your meeting minutes, and so on. Now, if you have any other questions about this topic, feel free to get in touch with us. Our contact information is listed at the end of this webinar. Now, powers of a family council. This is a session that is really important for you to understand because it is what contains the information on what you are legally empowered to do within a long-term care home. So, a family council has the power to do any or all of the following. So you do not have to carry out all of these powers, but you may provide information assistance and advice to residents, family members, uh, persons of importance, including when new residents are admitted to the home, advise those people of uh, their rights and obligations under the Act, advise them of uh, the rights and obligations of the licensee under the Act, attempt to resolve disputes between licensee and residents, sponsor and plan activities for residents. So if you see an opportunity for an activity for residents uh, within your home, you can sponsor and plan that. You can also collaborate with community groups and volunteers regarding those activities. You have the power to review inspection reports and summaries. There will be one a copy of the inspection report and the summary that should be given to the Family Council following each inspection under Section 149. You also have the power to review the written plan for achieving compliance prepared by the licensee that the director has ordered, detailed allocation of funding, financial statements relating to the home, and the operation of the home. Further, you have the power to advise the licensee of any concerns or recommendations the council has about the operation of the home as well report to the director, that's at the ministry, of any concerns or recommendations council feels should be brought to the director's attention. So these are really important powers to consider in terms of what your council is actually gonna do in the home. You don't have to do all of them. In fact, you don't really have to do any of them. The ones that family councils, the vast majority of them, do undertake are advising the licensee of concerns or recommendations, because family councils do operate as sort of the eyes and ears as well within a home, they're in the position to advise of any concerns they see, recommendations they have, and work with the home to resolve them. So you have that power. Many councils will also undertake planning and sponsoring activities for residents as a way to use their collective interest, knowledge, and capacities to support improved quality of life within that home. Interference is another really important section of the Act for families and staff to understand. The Ministry takes interference in the operations of the Family Council by staff very seriously. In fact, what the legislation says is that a licensee of a long-term care home shall not interfere with the meetings or operations of the Family Council, shall not prevent a member of the Family Council from entering the home to attend a meeting or perform any functions as a member, shall not prevent a family council assistant from entering the home to carry out his or her duties, and shall ensure that no staff member, including the administrator or other person involved in the management or operation of the home, does anything that the licensee is forbidden to do so. So the legislation and the ministry both take very seriously the autonomy and privacy and confidentiality of a family council. And this in my opinion, is demonstrated through this section where they take very seriously no interference by the licensee 
in the meetings or operation of the council. Now, that doesn't mean that staff people of the home aren't valuable supports to your family council. In fact, there is a section on family council staff assistance contained within the Long-Term Care Homes Act. According to the Act, family council staff assistants maintain confidentiality as requested by the council, perform duties assigned by the council, as best practice, we always encourage that these duties be discussed and negotiated between the council and staff assistant and the administrator. As we said, the goal of a family council is to be family led because we do believe that it, it and what we have found to be true, so councils are more effective, they pursue their goals and interests, and that work is more likely to get done because it's shared amongst members. But if there's something that you do feel you would really value or value benefit from the value provided by assigning a task to a staff assistant, that's something to discuss. Staff assistants also report to council. So if you've requested some information from the home, it is usually the staff assistant who would be bringing that and reporting to your council. And staff assistants need to be acceptable to council. And that's about ensuring that those duties assigned are working well, that you have a positive and open relationship with your staff assistant, but acceptable as a term is not defined in legislation. So that's really about that negotiation and that relationship building to ensure success. Now, now that you know what a family council is defined as, what legislation says, who your members are and can be, and the role of staff, let's look at actually how you get started. So assuming that you are in the infancy of a family council, so to speak, you wanna start by learning what you can, including the information contained in this session, but there's also a wealth of other materials and resources available on our website, which again is www.fco.ngo. So learn the basics. What is a family council? What's contained in the act? Reflect initially and at a high level on what you want to accomplish. What's your reasoning for wanting to have a family council? What is inspiring you? What's your passion about what you want to do as a group? So jot down a few ideas because those will help guide you through the rest of the process. And this is just one process out of possible many, many options for getting started, but it's one that we have found is effective. So then share your ideas, share what you've learned, share what you hope to accomplish through a family council. So just start talking to other families and friends of residents. Talk to home staff, your administrator and staff assistant, if there is one already. Discuss with them what it is that you want to, what you want to do as a group and get their feedback and ideas. And then get people together. That could be a planning team or an introductory meeting. If you have a few people, as little as three, that's a group. That's a group of people. That is more than enough to get you started. If you have a couple, divide up the work and start small. So think about a planning team or an introductory meeting, depending on the needs, interests, and capacities of the people who are starting this with you. There's more information about a planning team versus an introductory meeting in our family council guide to starting and maintaining a family council that you can access and download from our website free of charge or order a print copy from our website. And then you're going to want to think about those different organizational pieces. So your mission statement and goals, your leadership model, terms of reference, code of conduct, and then start thinking through a meeting schedule. Plan your first few meetings. Now, a little bit more on a planning team and how you go from a planning team to a council. So it could be two to three people interested in forming a council. You'll want to keep things flexible at this point in time. So that way you want to allow for an evolution of your group based on the needs, interests, and capacities of your members and to allow for it to grow. You want to take some time to get to know each other. 
because that's how you'll figure out who can take on what piece of work and what goals you're going to pursue based on those interests. You want some loose agendas for the first few meetings. And that could be things like you want to discuss uh, what are the interests of your members? What do people want to learn more about? It could be looking at doing a family interest survey, which we have examples of on our website, which are very useful for getting information about the interests and needs of the members and the families in your home. Having some sort of structure, though flexible, will help to keep you on track. And through that process, through getting to know each other and your first few meetings, you can start identifying your team member skills and interests. Because that's going to be how you share work and divide tasks. And then you can start to plan your first full meeting based on skills and interests, what's worked well in your agenda so far, some high level goals and so on. And a first meeting could be a meet and greet. It could be discussing what a family council is. It could be reviewing one of Family Council Ontario's uh, archived webinars. It could be a guest speaker. It could be any number of things. There's a wealth of possibilities for that first full meeting. And then you start to organize and a full family council. So that's when you can start doing things like a more formal terms of reference or planning your calendar for the year or looking at your relationship with your staff assistant. So as I said, this is one option for going from a planning team to a full council, but there are also other, avail other options. And if you find something that has worked really well for your group, please do share it with us. Now, a terms of reference is really the basic operating procedures of your group. It's not something that needs to be onerous or a thick pile of paper. It's really quite basic. But what it does is it helps to keep you on track as a group. So it helps to codify who you are and why you're here. So it's about that collective identity and your collective interest as a group. When are meetings going to be held and how often? It's important to establish regularity with meetings because that way people know when and where you're going to meet. So if it's every third Thursday of the month at 7 p.m., put that in your terms of reference. Who can be a member and who can't? So as we said, membership, including the right to be a member and the list of who cannot be a member is outlined in the legislation, the Long-Term Care Homes Act. But you can also consider continued membership in this section. How do you make decisions? This is a really important thing for councils to consider because as you grow and evolve, you'll need a way to determine what your next steps are and to determine if people are in agreement. So whether it's changing your leadership model or an activity or a goal to pursue, you need to establish how you decide that. So is it consensus? Is it 50% plus one vote, two thirds majority? All of these options have pros and cons to them, but it's really about what works best for your group. But essentially you have to make a decision about how you make decisions. And that'll include your council's leadership model. So do you want something that's more or less formal? And once again, going back to the support aspect, what are you going to do to respect confidentiality during and outside of meetings? How do you ensure that the safe and private space of a council is respected? Because if it's not, Members aren't going to feel comfortable sharing their experiences and questions with you. And they may be unlikely to come back to a future meeting. And all of that will negatively impact your ability as a group to achieve your goals. So it is very important to consider your council's approach to confidentiality. An important thing to consider is your mission statement and goals. So your mission statement is answering the question, who are we and why are we here? So what's your collective or common identity? So that could be just a line or two about ABC home, who you are and why you're here. And set a few basic goals of your group. Have a discussion about what you want to achieve. And these can be quite high level. 
perhaps your goals to begin with, and these can change as your group changes and evolves, but maybe it's educating members on uh, the long-term care home and health issues affecting us and our loved ones. Maybe a goal is to ensure open and collaborative communication and teamwork amongst families and between families and the home. Maybe it's to support new and current residents, families. So think about what you want to achieve, and these should be high level so that you can consider how to fit activities under those umbrellas. Set a few basic goals, the others can be add-ons. Once you have this, you've got a roadmap. You've got where you are now, so who you are, and where you want to go. Those are your goals. What do you want to achieve as a group? And in figuring out how you're going to do that, you need to figure out your leadership model. Now, there's two main approaches to leadership, and we call those the informal shared committee model or the formal traditional officer model. They're both good options for family councils, but it really depends on your group. So the informal or shared model, instead of having roles, as you see in the formal or traditional officer model, you have people responsible for tasks or chunks of work. So perhaps your meeting volunteer is the person who facilitates the meeting. Now that is a task that would traditionally fall under the chairperson role. So you can see how the pieces of work outlined in the informal model fit generally under the umbrellas of the roles in the formal or traditional officer model. Your records volunteer would be the one responsible for taking notes and ensuring that the meeting minutes are brought to the next meeting. Something that a secretary would do in the traditional or formal model. But the in the formal or traditional officer model, the secretary might also be responsible for maintaining your email account and your email distribution list, which in the informal model, something a communications volunteer might do. So there are different options available to your group depending on how many people you have, their interests, skills, and capacities. And if you start off with one model, you can change to a different model as long as you follow the procedure you've outlined for making decisions in your terms of reference. Now, one important consideration is that with the informal shared committee or formal traditional officer, you can share roles, you can rotate and so on. One person doesn't have to always be the records volunteer or the secretary. There are other options for flexibility that can be built into these models. You're also going to want to consider what you're actually doing with the time you have together as a group. So the when you meet, how often and where, make sure that's in your terms of reference. But what are you going to do during your meetings? How are you going to spend your time? Many councils balance the need for open sharing with working on council business. But what is that balance going to look like? What sort of things do you want to focus on? Do you want to have a guest speaker at every meeting, every quarter, etc.? So that's you need to figure out what you're actually going to do to make the most of your time together. Do you want to do other activities outside of meetings? Do you want to participate in home initiatives? Do you want to be doing activities for residents? This is up to you, but it's something that you need to decide upon as a group. And how do you know it's working? What's your evaluation model? We do encourage councils to evaluate regularly, especially when you're in that getting started stage. You're going to want to be checking in with one another regularly. And now that could be, uh, you know, pieces of paper submitted into the tissue box anonymously. It could be uh, or a plus delta at the end of each meeting, which is just a discussion of the plus, what worked well, delta, what we can change for next time. Uh, formal evaluations once a year are strongly recommended. So you need to figure out how you're going to know that this is working or not. Now, in terms of what to focus on during meetings, when to meet and so on, and other activities to pursue, a really useful way to get this information is to develop a family interest survey and have it completed by the families. We have an example of this on our website. It's in your guide to starting and maintaining a family council as well. 
but it's a survey that asks questions like, what's the best day of week, the week and time for you to meet? So getting at the when, how often question. What do you want to know about? You can have options for things within the home, long-term care sector, um, health and wellness of residents and so on. And it helps you to gather information about what to spend your time on and when to set aside that time. So as I said, you can find an example of that on our website and in our Family Council Handbook, your guide to starting and maintaining a family council. And then whatever you do as you move forward, try to stay positive. Family councils have incredible potential for positive impacts on the lives of families, residents, and staff in a long-term care home, and volunteers and visitors, and everyone who steps foot in that building. So you have incredible potential for doing good for residents and families, for helping staff do their jobs better. You have to stay positive. It's not always going to be easy or simple, but you have great capacity for doing good within a long-term care home. Now, inspire participation. And by that, we mean, we mean continually reach out to new folks. You know, next point about recruitment being an ongoing priority. There's lots you can try. You may have to try it over and over again. But inspiring participation is about reaching out to people and figuring out what sparks them. Figuring out what their passion is, their interest, their skill, and connecting that, weaving it into your family council. So if you have someone who is really good at graphic design, maybe they can develop a handout or a brochure for your council. That's something they're good at and has a clear and demonstrable positive impact on your council and your ability to achieve your goals. Maybe you have someone who's a natural facilitator and who is fantastic at running meetings. They might be a great option for your meeting volunteer or your chair. You need to figure out how to utilize those skills and interests, those capacities and those passions to help you achieve your goals so that those folks can see a clear connection between their involvement and council success. That's going to inspire them to participate actively, to keep coming back to meetings, and to work hard to ensure your success. You're always going to want to be looking at recruitment, about how you can build those bridges and bring more folks into your council. So reaching out to families and friends of residents, making sure that staff know who you are and what you do and your impact on the home so that they can help direct people to you. You're going to want to evaluate regularly. So as we said in frequent, so frequent check-ins, frequent and formal check-ins, and regular, more formal evaluation. Those are both things that are going to help you stay on track with your goals and your objectives, but it'll also help you to address any moments of conflict as they arise. Conflict in any group setting is normal, but it's how you address it that's going to determine your success as a group. So if you evaluate regularly and take the opportunities to address those moments of conflict or dissent, it will strengthen your group. And connect with other family councils. On our, data, on our website, we have a database of family councils wherein people have listed their contact information and descriptions of their family council so that others can get in touch with them. It is a great way to see who else is in your area, ask questions as you're developing your council or evaluating or entering the next stage of your, of your family council and your involvement in that home. So do take a look at that, see who's in your area. And if there isn't currently a listing for your family council, there's an option to sign up as well. And make sure that you are registered for the Family Councils Ontario monthly e-bulletin. That's where we're going to be publishing information about sector news and updates, uh, resources available for family councils and caregivers, but also news of our events, such as conferences, uh, webinars, and other gatherings and educational opportunities 
that you can take part in to connect with others and increase your capacities, skills, and knowledge as family council members. And as always, connect with us. You can reach us by phone, local and toll free. Uh, check out our website. That's where we have a wealth of resources and information, including links to other archived webinar sessions, a link to download the Your Guide to Starting and Maintaining a Family Council Handbook. Uh, it's also got our weekly blog that we publish September through December and then January through June. And these are blog posts from FCO staff as well as guest speakers on issues related to caregiving, long-term care, family council aspects, and more. It's a valuable resource that you can find on our website. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter for news and updates, resources, articles shared, and more. And you can get in touch with us directly. So as I said, I'm Samantha Peck. I'm the Director of Communications and Education. There's my email address there, along with our Executive Director, Client Services Coordinator, and Bilingual Outreach Coordinator, who is actually based in Sudbury and speaks both English and French, and is available to serve and work with Francophone Family Councils. Thank you for joining us for this session on Family Council 101, starting a family council. Can more than one family member be a part of the council? Yes. So uh, I'm not aware of any council that has limited involvement to one member per resident. So any family member or person of importance to a resident is entitled to be a member of the council, meaning that as long as that right to be a member isn't overridden by section, uh, that, that subsection about who cannot be a member, they're entitled to be a member, and yes, they would be able to vote. The goal is to have, of course, as much representation from all the family members of residents uh, living within that home. So more than one member can definitely be a part of the council. There have even been um, examples we know of where people like a mother and daughter or a husband and wife have shared leadership positions on the council or been those leaders. The information on the family council the information in the Family Council Guide is on your website, yes. So the Family Council Guide, your guide to maintaining a fam starting and maintaining a family council, which we refer to as our Family Council Guide or Handbook for short, is available to download from our website. It's quite a comprehensive document, but since it was published uh, back in 2010, we have issued a lot of, uh, a lot of supplementary materials. So the guide is definitely your place to start. It contains all of the basics. And, and then the other supplementary materials are in the resources section of our site and also contained in the blog posts as well. Is it absolute that a staff member of a home cannot be a member of the council or can the council membership waive this rule? No, the, it is an absolute as per law that a staff member cannot be a member of the family council. So uh, what you see in the membership section is the right to be a member, the right to be a member, uh, but also that it's pursuant to sub, that subsection, meaning that as family, as a staff member is listed in the, uh, in that subsection, they cannot be a member. So it is an absolute. Can the staff member who has a family member as a resident at a home be the staff liaison or staff assistant. There's nothing in the legislation that points to that one way or another. So that's that's something that would have to be decided upon by council. When that has arisen, uh, it's been that the decision is no because uh, it could put the family or the family member staff slash person in a difficult position and make the the other families um, not as comfortable um, because there's a staff person in the room. So uh, there are other ways to communicate with and connect 
that staff member who also has a family member at the home. And that would be perhaps inviting that person to a meeting when it's appropriate, uh, ensuring that like any other staff person, they, they have access to the meeting minutes and so on. But it is a negotiation about the role that a person whose staff and family member or resident plays with regards to the council, because it is really important to assure, ensure that there's no even appearance of interference with the operations of the council and that the needs and interests and confidentiality of the families are respected. Who can be a staff assistant and who appoints them? So there isn't any direction given in the legislation about who is a staff assistant. In most cases, the staff assistant is someone in administration or in social worker activation. So maybe the administrator, if, and remember that staff assistant has to be acceptable to counsel. So if that's an acceptable relationship and that person's acceptable to counsel, could be administrator, it's often a social worker or a social service worker. Um, it could um, be someone in activation or recreation, something like that. It wouldn't be nursing staff or PSWs. Uh, in terms of who appoints them, it's the licensee appoints the staff assistant and it's usually then delegated to the administrator to do so, but it is the responsibility of the licensee. Uh, if you're looking to um, advise folks of your family council, we, we don't take registration per se, uh, but we do always like to know if a home has a council so that we can support them. So in terms of registering um, your council, you would be connecting with your home to let them know. Uh, and then you can connect with us through our website or just sending us an email or giving us a call and letting us know. And that way uh, we have a better idea of actually how many councils are in the province, sort of what you're working on, your needs and your questions, so that we can better do our work at a systems level in terms of bringing forth family member grassroots concerns, recommendations and interests. So connect with your home, let them know, uh, and do let us know whether that's registering uh, as a listing on our website or connecting with us directly. We would appreciate it. Are there any rules around minutes and minute adoption? Not in the legislation. However, we do have a lot of best practices. Um, the Actually, the only rule in uh, the legislation is around posting of the information and that uh, I don't know it verbatim but basically that uh, any materials from family council can only be posted with consent from the family council so adopted meeting minutes and so on things that have been passed in terms of best practices we do have a lot of information on that on our website um, the main best practice around meeting minutes is that they should not be posted until or I guess main points, they shouldn't be posted until they're passed and that only the family council members uh, are responsible for editing and approving the meeting minutes. And uh, we strongly encourage that the writing of those meeting minutes is left to family council members as well to ensure that uh, it is in line with what uh, that is accurate and well reflected from the meeting. Thank you everyone for joining us for this Family Council 101 webinar. Uh, again, please do check out our website at www.fco.ngo. There you will find links to our other educational sessions, resources, materials, a uh, link to sign up for our e-bulletin, as well as links to our YouTube channel and other social media channels. Once again, my name is Samantha Peck. I'm the Director of Communications and Education for Family Councils Ontario. Thank you for joining and have a wonderful day.